So PayPal recently open sourced their key value database named JunoDB and I spent a few days going through it to understand its features and guarantees. In a series of videos, I will be going through the database talking about the key details and design decisions they took while building this. In the process, we will understand how a production grade key value store is built. This is the third video of the series and in this one I will be talking about how the database scales its compute, storage and more interestingly the storage layer making it truly horizontally scalable. So becoming a better engineer is the need of the art and to help you all reach the next level I have something that you will find amusing. I conduct super practical courses with a no-nonsense approach. These courses are designed to help you become a better engineer and ace your career. The courses will definitely reignite your love for engineering and spark the much needed engineering curiosity. Some of my most popular courses are on system design and database internals. Because I operate with a no-fluff approach, my courses are enrolled by folks across all levels from SD1s to tech leads to staff to EMs to VP engineering of some of the most prominent companies out there. All the details about the courses like curriculum, prerequisites, testimonials, FAQs can be found on the course pages and I have linked them in the description down below. So do check them out and I cannot wait to see you all become better engineers and ace your engineering career. Now let's go back to the video. So let's ask this question, why JunoDB needed to scale? Because instead of just making things infinitely scalable, you need to understand if there is even a need to scale and if yes, what exactly needs to be scaled. So JunoDB is a very core component for PayPal. It powers most critical core backend services that PayPal has. Now, as the number of microservices increases, the number of connections coming to this JunoDB would increase. So the first pain point that they need to address is the number of inbound connections they need to handle more. It's not about its load is still there, but more importantly, the number of inbound connections they need to handle is far more because as soon as you add one more microservices, Oh, sorry, as you add one more microservice, the number of connections that the database needs to handle, the number of concurrent connections the database needs to handle is near doubled, right? Now this is what is little interesting because to get a max performance, there is a persistent connection which is maintained between your client and your Juno proxy and your Juno proxy to your storage server. So as the number of microservices increases, the number of concurrent connections the number of concurrent persistent connections also increases. So this means the number of inbound connections that the JunoDB cluster need to handle shoots up, right? So that's the first thing why it needs to scale horizontally. Second, the amount of data. That because it is powering some of the key services around risk management, financial uh, basic transaction processing and authentication, you could see the amount of data that is stored on JunoDB key value store increases. So you need to increase your storage as well. Third is increase the number of reads and write requests that are coming in, which is your query load, which is your compute load. Because as the number of connections increases, the number of requests increases, the data increases, the amount of queries that are fired will also shoot up. When, when this happens, when this happens, you need to increase your compute capabilities as well. So let's talk about them one by one. Let's start with scaling connections. So to scale the number of connections. Now, this was the diagram that we saw. This was the high level architecture diagram of JunoDB that we saw in the previous one, right? In case you haven't watched that video, highly recommend you to watch that. But we could see this being the high level architecture of JunoDB. Now, what we want? We want JunoDB to handle large number of connections, persistent connections. So let's go through that if it actually does that or not. So your, you use Juno SDK to talk to your Juno backend. The Juno backend has load balancer. Now load balancer implicitly can horizontally scale and can handle persistent connections coming from your client. Right? So this solves that problem. Now for you to handle large number of connections, we know that each machine in the world has some limit to the number of concurrent, the, to the number of concurrent TCP connections that it can handle. Given that, if you want to, so because each machine has a limit for your system to handle large number of connections, you need to make this horizontally scalable. Now for you to make this horizontally scalable, we need to see if the way we would want to make it horizontally scalable, it needs, it needs to be stateless. So is Juno proxy stateless? That should be the key question because now 
because it is abstracted behind a load balancer, you can add as many Juno proxy instances as you want. But if this is stateful, then you cannot go beyond a certain number. So which is where your proxy has to be entirely stateless, although still maintaining persistent connection, but it would be easier for you to move persistent connection from one Juno proxy to another Juno proxy. Right? So does our Juno proxy's responsibility at this given stage allows us to do so? Yes, it allows us because now you can add more Juno proxy. Persistent connection is made to that and Juno proxy needs connection to all of the so anyway it is making connection to all of the storage servers right so all instances of juno proxy are actually stateless they are actually equal because of which what happens you keep adding more juno proxy as and when you need it your load balancer would create connections with all of them each instance of juno proxy creates connection with all of them so there is no state that needs to be maintained making it truly horizontally scalable. So for you to handle more inbound connections, you just need to add more Juno proxy instances over here. Given that your storage layer would still be able to handle it and your load balancer is seamlessly scalable, right? That's the beauty of it, right? Because it is stateless, you can very and stateless and equal. You can add as many Juno proxy instances so as to handle the large number of inbound connections that are happening. Brilliant. The second one is about scaling data. Now, this was easy to scale this because we designed it in a way that each instance creates connections with everyone and all. It was relatively easier to do. So it's horizontally scalable. You add more, but stateful things are hard to horizontally scale. Stateful implies databases, your data layer, your actual storage layer. So as data grows, you have to add more storage servers to it. Storage servers is where your actual key value data is getting stored. So as data grows, it is essential for you to add more storage servers. So now what JunoDB does is that we know that the data is split into partitions right? called shards. So what JunoDB does is when you start a JunoDB cluster, you pre-configure the number of partitions that you would have. Let's say you say I'll have 1024 partitions. That's it. It's a fixed number. You will not have beyond that many number of shards, no matter what, right? Here in the diagram, I, you could see six shards, but in reality, when you're, you start your JunoDB cluster, you have to specify the number of part, the number of shards that you would have. Let's say it's 1024. You cannot change it beyond that. You cannot change it after that. So the shards being fixed number, all the data that you do, all the data that you store will be distributed in this 1024 shards. And these shards are then distributed among the storage servers whose ownership is determined by consistent hashing that we do. Right? So now let's say I have two storage servers, storage server and storage server 2. And now what has happened is the load has increased. My storage servers are not able to handle the load, the incoming load that exists. I am taking example of 6 but in reality these are 1024 shards. Right? Now what will I do? I will want to add a new storage server to that. Now when I add a new storage server to that, what I'll have to do is I'll have to move this shard from one storage node to another storage node. How, how you would know which shard needs to be moved over here? Consistent hashing because they determine the data ownership that which shard goes on which storage server. So when you add it, the shards, you can move the shards and update the mapping over there. Right. So this is how simple it makes for you to add a new storage server and scale your storage layer seamlessly. Right. And when this gets changed, this storage server, like this shard is owned by another storage server. Now what would happen? This mapping will be updated in ETCD that is running on Juno proxy. As soon as ETCD discovers it, it would be strongly updating it. Uh, in a strongly consistent way, updating it across the Juno proxies. So they would all know about it. Right. And now this means that when your data comes, when your next request comes in, it will be automatically forwarded to the one that now owns that corresponding shard. So we just made our storage layer with respect to the capacity that it holds seamlessly scalable, truly scalable. Right. Now, what does ETCD host or uh, what does ETCD stores for us, it stores a configuration. What configuration? That this shard belongs to this storage server. And how does it do that? Consistent hashing, right? So it's a very standard implementation of consistent hashing, nothing fancy, 
put them all in a ring who let your storage server takes hold some spots on the store on the hash ring you take the shard hash it with the same hash function figure out the storage server at the right of it and that is the one that will own that corresponding shard right simple that's what that is exactly what your etcd or rather your proxy uses to identify where to forward a request to and who owns which shard which storage server owns which shard right a classic consistent hashing implementation want to read more about it arpitvani.me slash consistent hashing i have a very huge blog on it around implementation of it as well highly recommend you to look into that right okay so this is how your storage layer is defined your storage layer is made scalable but now and while ensuring minimal data movement when you add because now when you add over here you just need to move a few shards here and there few shards that were let's say if i add let me give a concrete example let's say i add a new storage server over here the shards that are the shards that are hashed in this location used to be owned by this storage server will now be owned by this storage server standard consistent hashing implementation so but every other thing remains unchanged that's the beauty of consistent hashing right okay so now how do you move the data because now that shards the number of shards are fixed each shard within the juno db has a bunch of micro shards now micro shards is the building block that forms a shard it's just a logical entity think of it like when you are moving a shard it's like moving a bunch of micro shards with it one at a time it's a building block of the data that you have the number of micro shards can vary with each shard right that's a internal detail of it so the flow now understand the flow the way it happens had to go through the source code to do this okay so given a key that you would want to store or access what do you first do you take the key you pass it through the murmur hash and compute a hash right so you pass it through the murmur hash uh, you pass it through the murmur hashing algorithm you take the murmur hash of it now you mod it by the number of shards that you have so that you know this key belongs to which shard this is not where consistent hashing is coming in consistent hashing comes for shard to storage server mapping here given a key you mod it by the number of shards because the number of shards are fixed you can do mod shard understand this that's why you are not using consistent hashing over here you are not using consistent hashing because the number of shards are fixed you are doing percent you are doing mod shard over here so hash mod shard you know which shard it belongs to now you from this you would know like these shards you know that it goes to this shard but this shard is present on which storage server you can get this using consistent hashing this is what your proxy is doing your proxy is running consistent hashing to get this mapping running as in it's not a process process it's just a mapping that is stored in etcd configuration so it uses etcd to know this shard is present on which storage server it talks to the storage server and forwards the request there right consistent hashing is just occasionally run whenever there is redistribution happening that's it. nothing fancy over there right but this is such a beautiful thing key highlight you do not have to use consistent hashing everywhere here because your number of shards are fixed you do not need consistent hashing to figure out which shard that is belong to because it does not make sense if it is elastic then you need consistent hashing otherwise you don't number of shards are fixed you can just use a normal mod function like basically mod number of shards to know which shard would own this corresponding key so no consistent hashing over here but because your storage servers can add and be removed from your infrastructure you need to know which shard is owned by which storage server this is where consistent hashing is used understand this really well so the total number of shards key highlight or again remember this total number of shards is fixed let's say 1024 and these are distributed across storage servers using consistent hashing right okay and paypal uses like the current setup of paypal as mentioned by them has 200 storage nodes which distributes 1024 shards roughly each storage node would have how many 1024 divided by 200 so each storage node handles roughly 5 shards and they process 100 billion request every day 100 billion request every day so pretty huge scale so which is where i say you don't need over complex architecture to handle this right mercent mod shard would work you don't need consistent hashing everywhere so don't be under that mis misconception that consistent hashing is a magical solution it is not right okay and this is how your juno db seamlessly scales 
your storage layer. Today, in this video, we saw uh, we talked about scaling of JunoDB. Just to give you a recap, we saw, we understood why JunoDB needs to be scaled, how storage, network, and compute needs to be scaled. We saw how the network and compute are seamlessly scaled horizontally because they are stateless and equal. Then we talk about how uh, we scale the no sorry how we scale the storage layer. Where do we use consistent hashing? Where do we not use consistent hashing? How a key design decision is taken by JunoDB by fixing the number of shards that it has. This way, when we are doing it, we just do a mod shard over here, right? And then to figure out where which storage server the shard belongs to, they use consistent hashing. Mapping is stored in ECDD, distributed across Juno proxy instances. Each proxy has persistent connection to the backend to the storage layer, and that's how the request goes through, right? And yeah, this is how JunoDB seamlessly scales their storage, their computer network. So yeah, this was the third video in this series. If you found it interesting, I hope you found it interesting, hope you found it amusing. That's it for this one. I'll see you in the next one where we talk about availability. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, where we talk about availability. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks.